Dr. Victoria Lebeau, I'm the National Program Leader for the SPECA program, and I'm joined by Dr. who's the program specialist. Um, in this webinar, we'll cover um, everything that's in the request for applications for the SPECA program, which is the secondary education, two-year post-secondary education, and agriculture in the case of classroom grants. If you aren't muted, please make sure that your audio is muted um, because this session is being recorded. Um, so the request for applications is your guide through the solicitation, and that has all the information that I'm going to cover today. If you haven't yet gotten a copy of the request for applications or RFA, there is a link that I put in the chat box earlier, so you can click that link and grab it. Also, these slides are available, and you can all these links are hyperlinked. So the applications are due at 5 p.m. Eastern on April 16th. That is a firm deadline. If you submit at 501, your application will be late and will not be reviewed. So please make sure that you abide by all the deadlines. And we do have um, approximately $900,000 available for funding this year. Um, so throughout this presentation, you'll see a gray bubble, um, like you see in the upper right-hand corner of this um, slide here with the RFA and the page number. And that's just a tool that I put so that if you guys get these slides and are trying to figure out where did I get this information from, it will tell you exactly where to go in the RFA to find that information. Okay, so let's get started with um, the program details. So SPECA, the purpose of SPECA is to, one, increase the number and diversity of students we have that are going to be pursuing two and four year degrees in the food, agricultural, natural resources, and human sciences. And then also to make sure that the quality of instruction that we have in this area is what we need it to be for um, present needs in agriculture, but also for future needs. And so this program is often used to um, create curriculum and create instructional delivery systems for new topics in the agricultural sciences or in topics that um, need revamping to be. So those are the types of applications that we're looking for. And then again, here in the upper right-hand corner, you see RSA page five. That's where I'm getting this information from, and you'll see that throughout the presentation. The project is the project submitted to SPECA should be focused on K through 14 students. So that is um, K through 12 students, and particularly we have a section called Agriculture in the K through 12 classroom. Um, then secondary school, which would be grades 9 through 12. Um, I understand some of you all secondary school for you might be grades 8 through 12 or 7 through 12. That's fine. That can be in that category. And then our junior or community college um, programs. Now we do have projects that will cover multiple of these areas. So it might be a project that um, uh, joins high school students with a community college, and that's fine. You don't have to fit specifically into one of these bubbles. Um, but the big thing about this is just to note that SPECA does support in uh, for credit academic instruction. And so that could be something that's happening daily in the classroom. And it could also be an after school activity or it could be a summer internship or something like that. But if it is an out of classroom activity, it does need to link back to the classroom training in some way so it is tied to the degree or diploma. Uh, so for those of you who are in 4-H who might be on the call right now, um, your project may be allowable and eligible in SPECA as long as it's linked to some formal um, pathway for the students. Speaking specifically about the agriculture in the K-12 classroom area, those are projects that are specifically made um, for or um, working with the National Agriculture in the Classroom Association, and this is their website here, agclassroom.org, and this is listed in the request for applications. And what we require is that you receive a letter of support from your state agriculture in the classroom contact. Um, what the purpose of the letters is is just to confirm that your um, product will be used by agriculture in the classroom and distributed to classrooms throughout your state. And that is not a duplication of resources um, since there are other USDA resources going to support agricultural literacy. Um, if there is not an agriculture in the classroom affiliated um, program in your state through the National Agriculture in the Classroom Association, if they don't have an active program in your state, you do not need a letter from them since one doesn't exist. And then, um, we have had folks in the past say that they have letters of support from other organizations, like they have support from FFA or um, from National Grange or something like that. That's great. I encourage you to partner with many organizations. However, you would still need a letter from your state agriculture in the classroom program if you're going to apply specifically to that ag and the K-12 classroom category. 
If you don't want to give a letter with them or partner with them, you can still apply to SPECA, but it would need to be for grades 9 through 12 or community colleges. For those of you online who are agriculture and classroom state contacts, these are some of the questions that you all have given me previously. One is that can you write more than one letter of support? Absolutely you can. Um, and then can you write a letter of support for someone else if you're still applying? Yes, you can. Because again, your letter is just saying that, yes, these resources would be um, utilized throughout the state. We'll share them with other folks throughout the state, and it's not a duplication of what we already have um, um, in place in our state. Um, if I don't support a project, do I have to write a letter? No, you don't. As is currently written in the request for applications, these are projects specifically developed by or for agriculture in the classroom. So this is not something that your program wants to support. You're not required to write a letter. Um, and that's, that's based on what um, feedback that we've had in the past from stakeholders. So moving on, we're going to go to the educational need areas. And um, this can be found starting in the RFA on page 8. And there are essentially three kind of big categories for educational need areas. One is curriculum development, um, instructional delivery systems, and the expansion of student career opportunities. Secondly, it's faculty preparation and enhancement for teaching. And thirdly, it's facilitating interaction with other academic institutions. And I should say this is really with other partners. So it could be nonprofits, businesses, farmers, et cetera. Um, again, with the educational need areas, you don't have to fit cleanly into one category. You can do multiple of these different need areas. Just make sure that whatever need area you're meeting in your application that you support that fully um, and explain how you're going to meet all of those categories and explain how you're going to evaluate the work that you're doing in all of those categories. So in the curriculum development area, these are um, activities such as creating or improving existing curricula, um, creating new or different learning resources and materials. This could include making something that right now is a static resource into a digital or web resource. And then any type of project designed to attract, recruit, and retain students in the agriculture related field. For faculty preparation for teaching, this is really any type of professional development for your faculty where they can increase their competency and leadership in the food and agricultural sciences. So this could be teachers who are not ag teachers. It could be a general science teacher, but you want them to have some agricultural skills um, or, or increase uh, their subject matter expertise in a, in a new field in agriculture. Um, really anything that would enhance the student recruitment um, and student learning outcomes. And then also here would be training faculty or other folks in your school system. So this could be a counselor or an advisor in careers in agriculture so that they're better able to then um, uh, provide guidance to their students. And then thirdly, the facilitating interaction with, in with other academic institutions. This would be promoting um, new or stronger institutional collaborations. It could be creating a new pathways from your high school into a community college. It could be articulation agreements, so two plus two ag agreements between the high school and the community college or two-year program, as well as two plus two plus two agreements so that they're even getting credit for, high, you know, they're in high school but getting credit towards a four-year degree. So all of that will fall under this category. We're going to move on now to the um, award information. This um, starts with grant types on page 11 of the RSA. And this talks about how much you can apply for and what you can do with those funds. So there are three grant categories. One is a regular grant for $50,000. This means that it is a single applicant. And there's no requirement that you share grant funds with anyone. Secondly is our collaborative grant type one, which is up to $150,000. Um, the requirement partner with at least one other institution. And then the collaborative grant type two, which is up to $300,000 award, which is an applicant and you're required to partner with at least two additional partners. Now these are minimums. You can have many, many partners, but this is what is minimally required by the um, RFA. So to start with the regular grant, that again, that's a single institution. It's a total of up to $50,000. You can always apply for less if your project requires less. And then again, um, you don't have to partner with anyone. However, um, it is, they are projects that should support more than a single class or more than a single instructor. So it should at least support um, students throughout your school and not just a single, like say, one biology class. Um, this is one example of a regular grant project. This was funded in 2016. The title is Equipping Wayne County High School Students for Careers in Ohio Bioenergy and Wastewater Water Industries. This is a $40,000 project. 
And um, this project was designed because they saw a need that students coming out of their high schools were prepared either to get advanced degrees in chemistry and related fields or to be able to go directly into the bioenergy bioprocessing um, fields and get jobs. And so they worked on training students to have the core analytical and operational tools needed to do specific types of testing, um, such as assay-based wastewater analysis, um, uh, liquid chromatography, and other things like that. And so this was a project where they were um, instituting job training in several different classes throughout the school, but this was a single institution instituting this project. You can find abstracts of all our previously funded grants on the Speck of Funding Opportunity page, which is linked um, here in the chat box. So if you click on the Funding Opportunity page link and scroll to the bottom, there will be a link that says read the abstract, and you can find all the previously funded projects. Next, we have Collaborative Grant Type 1 projects, which again, that's plus at least one partner. That means you're required to have at least one partner and share grant funds with that partner. Uh, the project total is $150,000, and that's for um, the entire project, not for partner. Um, and then in, you are required to share at least half the grant funds if you choose a collaborative grant type one. Here's an example of one of these projects. Um, this is building capacity for school-based agricultural education in the food insecure region of Michigan's Upper Peninsula. Um, and here the, um, the applicants, the PDs, they partner Michigan State University with some area high schools, and they brought both the students and the teachers onto their farm to do both teacher um, training and mentoring and um, visits with the students themselves so that they could increase their awareness and the presence of agricultural sciences in their curriculum. So the partnership was between the university and then um, several of the high schools in their district. And then collaborative grant type two, that's the applicant where you're required to share the grant funds with at least two partners. Again, you can have many partners, but you're required to share with at least two. You can apply for up to $300,000, and you're required to share the grant funds. And the details are there below. You have to um, make sure that you retain somewhere between 30 and 70% of the funds, so you can't retain um, more than 70% of the funds, so that means that each at least 10%, but of course the partners can receive different amounts and they can receive more than 10% if you deem it appropriate. The big difference between a collaborative grant type 2 and a collaborative grant type 1, besides that extra partner, is really the scale and the scope. Uh, a collaborative grant type 2 project should be a multi-partner approach where you're doing something on a state or regional level to really um, enhance food and agricultural, natural resources, and human sciences um, at some combination of the K through 12 and community college levels. Here's one example of a project that we funded. I think this was just funded in 2017. Um, this is connecting land-grant university research centers to secondary agricultural education. Now, this was submitted by University of Idaho. And they partnered with several land grants in their region to provide hands-on training um, and, and research experiences for high school students. So the high school students would go to the university campus. And then they also provided mentoring both to the high school agricultural teachers as well as the researchers at the university because we all know that just because you're a great scientist doesn't mean that you're really great at explaining things to a high school student. So they have a lot going on here. That's what kind of makes it that collaborative grant type two is that they're hitting multiple levels and that it's a large enough scale that they were able to um, include linger institutions from multiple states in their projects. Again, this and all the other abstracts are available on the SPECA Funding Opportunity page. Some additional award information, this can be found on page 12 of the RFA. The grant duration is two to three years. So if you're doing a regular grant or a collaborative type one grant, you can have a project that is um, two years or three years. If you're doing a collaborative type two project, that's that $300,000 largest um, amount of funding project, then you have to be a three-year project. Um, there is a limit of one application per institution. This is new this year. And I realized that there was an error in the RFA when it was first released. Um, and there was a chart on page six or seven that said that there was no limits. That was an error that has been corrected. Please make sure you're using the most up-to-date version of the RFA. Um, there is a limit of one application per institution. Additionally, 
we're asking that there are only one SPECA awards open at any given time at any institution. That's because we just have such a tiny amount of funds for this program and we're getting so many applications. We want to make sure that we're being fair to everyone and um, allowing um, geographic diversity in terms of who's getting these funds. So if you think you might have an open award at your institution but you're not sure, check with your Office of Sponsored Programs and if they're still not sure, they can ask me um, and I can look it up for you all and tell you if you have an open uh, SPEC award at your institution. Also, if you're not sure if anyone else at your institution is interested in submitting, again, check with your Office of Sponsored Programs. I encourage larger institutions who may have multiple faculty interested to host an internal competition first where you decide which um, application to submit. If we receive more than one application per institution, um, we will try to call you and ask if who do you want us to accept, um, but just depending on our workload, if we don't have time, we may just accept the first one that we get. So it's better that um, you, know, you all decide on your own and this is not done by happenstance or luck. Moving on to eligibility, this um, can be found on page 13 of the RFA. The eligibility includes public secondary schools, um, and this is actually also um, public elementary schools are eligible as well, um, but not the district. So if um, a lot of schools, your money and your funds run through the district, and I understand that, um, but this is based on congressional legislation. I do not make this up. So the district can be the AOR, which is the Authorized Organizational Representative, but they can't be the applicant institution. So you still need to pick a single school to be the applicant institution and then the district um, can be, or the school board can be that um, organizational representative and that, that basically allows them the privileges to do all the paperwork. They would accept funds and then distribute the funds to the individual schools. Um, and then also and along with public school, uh, secondary schools, it's public or private junior technical and community colleges any institutions of higher education as well as um, nonprofit organizations. Um, there is a note here that the project director must be a citizen national or permanent resident of the United States. This year there is no matching requirement that changed with the um, farm bill that just got passed. Um, and if you decide that you have matching anyway because you have a really great sponsor, that's fine, but that will not be factored into how your um, application is reviewed or evaluated. Moving on to application information, um, the key thing here is that if this is your first time applying to any federal grant, you really need to start now getting registered because um, grants.gov does require you to have a DUNS number and a SAMS number and the guidance is that this can take up to a couple of months to get done. Generally it happens within two to three weeks, but I wouldn't chance it. So if you have never applied, if your institution has never applied for federal funding, you definitely want to start now. And you go to grants.gov, there is a tab at the top that says applicants, and you can um, scroll to organizational organization registration, and then that will tell you what you need to do to get registered. Okay, then one other thing that I wanted to point out in terms of how to get through this application is to use both the RFA, which is what I'm walking you through now, and the application guide. So the NIFA application guide has a lot of details on actually how to fill out forms and it's a really important document to have when you're trying to um, fill out your application. I get a lot of questions about this, but I, the next couple of slides are just kind of screenshots to walk you through how to get this application guide. So if you start at the funding opportunity page, which again that link is there in the chat box, you'll see this link that says apply for grants. If you click that button, it's going to take you to grants.gov. And it will take you actually to the specific SPECA opportunity within grants.gov. You'll see that tab that says package and you want to click that button. And then you'll see the opportunity to preview and that's going to preview everything that's in the grant application package. Once you click preview, there's a little button at the top right corner that says download instructions and that is where you get the NIFA application guide. So, um, it's a little tricky if you don't know um, how to do it, so I encourage you to go ahead and grab these slides so you can just have this, um, these pictures as a reference. Um, again, the slides are available in the file transfer box, um, but then that will take you to the NIFA grants application guide, so both the RFA and the application guide are what you'll use to walk yourself through um, the application process. 
So a couple of details to remember as you start working on your applications is that all the documents must be in PDF format. If it's not in PDF format, we see a blank page. So please make sure if it's a chart, if it's a graph, any, any um, you know, sometimes people will send you letters as um, Word documents. We can't see any of that, and so the reviewers won't be able to see any of that. So make sure it's all PDF. Um, also, please be mindful of your page limits. Um, we will screen these applications, and if it goes outside of the page limits, um, it doesn't go to panel. So make sure that you abide by the page limits, 20 pages, double space, um, 12 point font, and then you do get an additional five pages for tables and figures. I do get asked, can the tables and figures be integrated throughout the application? That's fine. However, I suggest that you make it very easy for us to see that you did not go over your page limit um, because if we're in any doubt, you may get screened out. So um, just be mindful that you don't use that as an opportunity to add another page of text because um, we, we are trying to keep it fair for everyone and so we do scrutinize that. Additional application instructions are on pages 16 through 22 of RFA. Um, you can find instructions for the abstract on page 16. Note that there is um, a, a worksheet that you can fill out for your abstract, and it, it's like a PDF fillable form. You don't have to use that form, but I, it's designed to make it easy for you, and it's designed to make it easy for the reviewers to quickly um, learn what they need to learn about your um, application. Um, and then the narrative instructions start on page 17, as well as all the instructions for other documents. This is kind of guiding you where you can find that information. Um, some funding restrictions that you'll find starting um, on page 23 is that funds cannot be used for the construction of new buildings or the refurbishment of buildings. That means you can't use funds to fix the air conditioning in the lab. You cannot build a greenhouse or um, any kind of permanent structure. Uh, you cannot use these funds for any kinds of promotional um, items, t-shirts, prizes, giveaways, um, cookouts. None of that is allowed to be um, paid for with SPECA funds. Now, um, if you want to do this as an addendum to your SPECA project and someone else pay for it, that's fine, but you can't use SPECA monies for these things. And then you cannot use grant funds for student tuition or scholarships. However, you can pay student stipends. Um, for participation, like if they're doing, if you're doing some kind of summer workshop and, and the kids are participating in your project instead of having a summer job, you can give them a stipend so that they're not having to choose between an academic experience and a work and, and you know work money. All right, moving on to the evaluation process and criteria. Um, all of this information again is in the RFA, and also NIFA has a lot of information on our main website, nifa.usda.gov, about our evaluation process. But essentially the way that it works is that your application will be given to um, three or four reviewers and we select reviewers from all over the country. We select as diverse a group of reviewers as we possibly can, so different parts of the country, different types of um, schools, different levels in their careers, both um, you know, younger teachers and faculty all the way up to um, senior faculty, senior teachers. We've had emeritus folks, we've had deans. We've had, we have folks from industry, we have farmers, we have folks from nonprofits, so we get a pretty diverse mix of folks. Um, we give each, appli um, each applicant gets three or four reviewers. They have time on their own to read through and evaluate your um, application according to the review criteria included in the request for applications. And then they kind of write up their notes and score and judge your um, application individually. And then we all come together as a group and the whole body of reviewers, and that just, the number we have kind of just depends on how many applications we have. Um, but we all come together as a group and we'll discuss um, every single application that we get. And the people who read your application will share what their thoughts were and um, they'll kind of kick off the discussion. And then the entire group gets to weigh in. So they can see your application, your abstract, they'll see the notes from the three or four people who read it. So it ends up being a pretty robust discussion, um, and then they will rank uh, the, the final top uh, proposals. Um, and then what you will receive, whether you're accepted or rejected, is the notes from the summary group discussion as well as the individual reviews. So that's how our evaluation process works. Um, every application is evaluated using the same evaluation criteria, criteria, which are listed here and also in the RFA on page 25. Just a few last tips, and then we're going to leave all the rest of this time for questions. The main thing is please don't wait until the last minute to submit. Go ahead and be working now. 
Um, if you have any technical issues, I would start with grants.gov because they have a really excellent um, tech team and they are, are best able to help you with their systems. Um, but if you have any programmatic questions, you're feel, feel free to reach out to um, us anytime. You can reach us at k 14 at nifa.usa.gov. Um, we are still um, uh, compiling our review panel for this year. So to submit this year, feel free to submit um, an application to be a reviewer and just write to me and say, hey, I'd be interested in serving as a reviewer and send me your um, CV and we'll share that with the panel manager. Um, please note that if you're applying this year, you cannot serve as a reviewer this year, um, obviously. Okay. Just for your awareness, I want you to know that there are some other education funding opportunities besides SPECA, and here's the list. I want to go through these one by one, but I encourage you again to grab these slides so you can have these links available. And then again, you can contact me directly, or um, there's always somebody monitoring our K-14 at nifa.usda email box, so I, I think that's a great resource for you. And then finally, just before we get to questions, just a reminder, if you're trying to grab the slides and you don't see a file transfer box, you can go up to the um, upper left-hand corner. You should see the tab that says File, then go to Transfer, and that should open up the file transfer box. Um, I'm going to put the slides there again just in case they disappeared since I did it earlier this afternoon. All right, so that's it for me with my general overview. If you all have questions, if you'll go ahead and start to type those into the chat box, and then we'll start answering questions. Please keep yourself on mute because this is being recorded. We want a really clear recording for everyone. So if you have questions, just um, type it in and we'll get to it. All right, so these slides again should be in the file transfer box. Okay, so let's see. The first question, it looks like it's from Buddy. Victoria, if the institution has a SPEC award that ends in August of 2019, is that institution eligible to apply this year? Um, yes, but yeah, I would say that if the award will end before September 1st, which is when, we'll, when our new awards for 19 will start, you can go ahead and apply. But please be mindful that if they're requesting a no-cost extension this year, or um, you know their first or second no-cost extension, which would keep the award active, um, then that would make them ineligible. But if the award will be completely finished by the end of August, then yes, you can go ahead and apply. Second question, can you submit as the lead institution if your institution is partnering on another submission? Yes, you can. There's no limit to the number of times you can partner on an application. Um, then there's a question from Laverne. On the grants.gov application, is the name of the applicant the individual school? Yes, the applicant institution would be the individual school, Laverne, and then if there's, you know, if your school board or somebody like that is going to be your organizational representative, they would be the AOR, Authorized Organizational Representative. Other questions? Can the partner be another school within the same district? Yes, Chris. Um, we've had a question asking when will the presentation be shared? We'll try to have it posted this week if we can. Um, if not, sometimes, yeah, maybe even by tomorrow. Um, so yeah, in the next day or so, we'll try to get this posted. Um, let's see. If you're applying to create curriculum targeting 9 through 12, do we need a letter from AITC? No, Shannon. That's a different. That's a different category. If you're doing 9 through 12, you don't need an, a letter from AITC. Um, Don asked, can I say anything about indirect costs? Yeah, the indirect cost rate, it really depends on what your negotiated rate is with your, with your institution. If your institution has a maximum of 30% indirect cost, then um, that would be the maximum. Um, the 30 or 42%, yeah, Rusty, I, if you want to um, send me an email, I actually have a worksheet that can walk you through how to calculate your indirect cost rate at either 30 or 42%. Um, that's also available on the NIFA website, but if you send me an email, I can send you the worksheet for that.
Okay, other questions? So we have a question here, do you need a support letter from the high school? I would encourage you to have support letters from any and everyone who is going to provide a critical role in your project. Um, so if you have students coming from a specific high school or teachers coming from a specific high school, you definitely want to show the panel that this institution or this organization is fully supportive of your project idea. And there is no limit to the number of letters of support that you can submit. That's not included in your 20-page narrative. That's an other attachment, and there's no page limit on other attachments. Okay, any other questions before we close for the afternoon? Okay, well, we'll stay online for another three minutes, um, but for those of you who want to go ahead and log off, thank you so much for joining us this afternoon, and um, best of luck on your application. Okay, so last call for any questions for anyone who's still on the line. Okay, so we have a question from Celeste. Um, can two high schools work as partners? Yes, of course. You can have any combination of partners that you would like to from any different groups of institutions. Um, so, so let's follow up question was, can two high schools in the same district be partners? And um, the answer is yes, because the applicant is the school, it's not the district. The applicant is the individual school. Okay, well, um, I don't see any more questions popping up, so again, we appreciate you joining us. If you haven't yet done so, you can go ahead and grab these slides before we close out. And then if you have any follow up questions after this, um, feel free to reach out to us, k 14 at nifa.usda.gov. All right, thank you all.